Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Lattes and Leadership. Uh, before we begin, I just want to give uh, a few Zoom instructions. If you can please make sure that you are using the uh, speaker view, that way you are seeing the person who is speaking in the moment. Uh, we also want to ask you to please be sure your microphone is muted, but we do want to hear from you. So if you have any questions, type them in the chat box and we'll be monitoring them throughout the conversation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Miller. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Welcome everybody to our Lattes and Leadership um, program we started with the American Heart Association. I'm the executive director in Westchester County. I'm thrilled to have you all here today. Um, today, we're going to discuss a topic that's near and dear to all of our hearts, women's health research. We're joined by two special guests um, and who will share their knowledge and about the current trends and topics uh, in this field. And, but before we get started, uh, I just want to remind anyone who um, is joining us today to use the chat feature. And please feel free to ask um, both of our presenters questions throughout the program. We'll be monitoring it and uh, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Now I'm pleased to introduce and welcome Dr. Nisa Volberg and Dr. Marina Holtz. Welcome doctors. Um, I'd like you to start by introducing yourselves um, just a couple of seconds each. So, and then we'll um, launch into our first topic. Dr. Goldberg, start with you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's always exciting to spend time with the American Heart Association. And I am a cardiologist and medical director of the NYU Women's Heart Program, as well as senior advisor for women's health strategy at NYU Langone Health and associate clinical associate professor of medicine at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. I'm also a radio host. Um, NYU has a collaboration with Sirius XM Radio, and uh, I have a weekly program called Beyond the Heart, where we talk about women's health issues that are, that are important to women and their families. And also, I'm an author, where I wrote a book um, several years ago for the general public called Women Are Not Small Men, Life-Saving Strategies for um, Preventing and Healing Heart Disease in Women, and also a Complete Guide to Women's Health. Thank you. Dr. Holtz, can you introduce yourself, please? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Marina Holtz. I am the Dean of the Graduate School of Basic Medical Sciences at New York Medical College. I am also professor of cell biology and anatomy. I am a basic scientist. I study diseases of women, um, and we try to understand the basic mechanisms of how cells grow and proliferate, and it's so important for so many conditions, from various tumor disorders to heart disease. Um, I am passionate about uh, advancing the careers of women in science. I participate in several initiatives in various professional societies, mentoring and nurturing younger scientists. Um, and I'm also very passionate about women's health and it's a privilege to be here on this panel. Thank you both. It's an honor to have you both spend um, this time with us today. So for our first topic, I wanna to start with uh, trends in women's research. And I'm going to start with Dr. Goldberg. Um, the, there's an alarming study that says that younger, more diverse women are much less likely to know that heart disease is their number one health threat. And what does that mean to you? That means that we have a serious problem. Um, you know, in 2004, when we started the Go Red for Women campaign, largely to raise awareness amongst women, um, of their risk factors and symptoms of heart disease in women, we also had a goal to improve the research that was much needed to improve care for women in their doctor's offices, because without that research, we don't have the tools to treat women properly. So this alarming study, um, in addition to showing that we're missing um, the message to women that heart disease is their leading health threat, particularly to women under 50 and women of, of diverse backgrounds. So women um, 
who are black and brown are less aware than white women about their risks for heart attack and their symptoms. In fact, with all the incredible work we've done with Go Red from 2004, when less than 10% were aware of their risk of heart disease or that heart disease was their greatest health threat, we got it to nearly 50% a few years ago, but in 2020, we saw that, that awareness go down by 20%, largely driven by younger women. And I think the real problem here is that we're not um, engaging younger women because they, young people think that they're not at risk for heart disease because they consider it more a disease of older people. But because of our research in women and heart disease and the, the targeted research that we do with Go Red, we found that conditions that affect younger women like pregnancy related conditions such as high, high blood pressure during pregnancy, gestational diabetes and preeclampsia actually increase cardiovascular risk later in life. And and another area that is under um, increasing research is the issue of autoimmune diseases. And because of its, in, its inflammatory nature, and I'm sure Dr. Holt will talk about the basic science related to this, is that those conditions increase risk for cardiovascular diseases such as high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, and sudden cardiac death in women. Dr. Holtz, do you want to add that basic science component that Dr. Goldberg just referenced? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's very important to study uh, the uh, risk factors for younger women for developing heart disease or suffering from conditions like stroke. And uh, Dr. Goldberg is absolutely correct that women, younger women, don't think that they're susceptible to these diseases. And they also are never on the lookout for the signs and symptoms of a, a stroke that might be happening or that something that doesn't feel right could be actually signs of uh, a, a heart attack. Um, and we need to study the susceptibility factors, um, the, uh, what, what are the genetic factors or environmental factors that predispose younger women for these conditions. And we need to increase the awareness, but not only in, um, in patients, but also in, in the physician populations, because some physicians are, are still are, think that uh, you know, women are not the ones who they should uh, look out for when they try to diagnose and treat these conditions. So awareness is needed all around. And uh, Dr. Goldberg is a shining example example of what happens when physicians are very aware of uh, the, the conditions that affect women. Excellent. Um, can both of you talk a little bit about some of the current topics being funded and published by the American Heart Association, um, especially those related to maybe diet and stress and um, prevention? Well, there was a re there are some recent studies that came out uh, were made possible because of AHA funding as well as published in the prestigious journals published by the American Heart Association. One particular um, study of interest was was on diet because everybody is interested in what they eat and how it will help them promote better health. And what they did was uh, these researchers looked at a population of 100,000 postmenopausal women and um, separated the groups into women who had low plant, high meat intake, low plant based intake versus women who had high plant uh, based diet, low meat intake. And they found that those people those women who um, predominantly had a plant-based diet had about a 12% lower risk of death due to cardiovascular disease, diseases or cardiovascular events, but more importantly, and something that everyone is concerned about is their memory, a 20% lower risk of deaths related to dementia. And I just want to point out there were similar studies done in the past in, in individuals who were over 65, and the data was very similar. 
that a plant-based diet or Mediterranean style diet, which has been shown to lower cardiovascular risk is not only helpful in lowering heart attack ri death risk, but also preserving memory. Dr. Holtz, did, I want to give you a chance to share anything on this. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm specifically interested in um, the role of uh, sex hormones in uh, predisposing uh, women or men for different types of heart disease. Um, and there are several studies that focus on the role of sex hormones in mediating cardiac and metabolic disorders um, in patients with heart failure, which is very important. Um, and also uh, the, the role of pregnancy in uh, mediating some of the female specific um, heart, heart diseases. Um, and I think that is a little bit underappreciated uh, <laughs> because diabetes during uh, gestational diabetes during pregnancy increases risk of heart disease. And that's something that uh, is uh, very important to monitor in uh, pregnant women and also in women who ha have given uh, birth. Um, so there are so many important studies that are focusing specifically <laughs> on the role of sex hormones and pregnancy in development of heart disease in women. Um, so I did have a question about the significance of funding more research to better understand women's health during pregnancy. Um, do you feel we've covered it or Dr. Goldberg, do you want to add something there? Well, I, I want to talk about um, the <laughs> whole issue of research funding and who's doing the research and how we have to encourage people who are interested in research, who are training in medicine and basic sciences, that there is an opportunity for women who are just starting their careers for the much needed research on car to, to study cardiovascular issues in women, both in a clinical setting, in, direct, in areas where we deliver patient care, as well as the basic science setting. And unfortunately, um, we're seeing fewer women going into research fields um, compared to men. And research funding, it's very interesting. For a long time, research funding has always gone pr with priority to more experienced researchers. And in cardiology, where just about 12% of the board certified cardiologists in our country are actually women, you could see that's mostly funded by, the funding goes to, to, to men who are already established. And I think we need a two pronged probe. We have to help save the lives of women who may be at risk for heart disease by awareness um, and, and tools that they need in the office. But we have another job and another job is to find ways, um, especially with the work of the American Heart Association that we can mentor and encourage or have programs to encourage young women to develop careers in research and team them up with experienced researchers who may be able to mentor them as well as me being more open to funding people who may not have done every single clinical trial that's been existence, but also give people a, a chance. And I know the American Heart Association has done that before because you have, uh, um, there's multiple layers of research and you've been very good about this. There's young investigator awards that, that can be given to people who are just starting out but you know, it would be great to also engage these, these young women and also increase the diversity of people who are doing research um, in how they go about doing this. You know, for those people who may not be in areas where there's enough mentorship. Dr. Holtz, I know that this has been an important topic for you is uh, representation and why it's so important to um, fund the work of women researchers? Yes, this is absolutely crucial because in order to study diverse uh, 
health uh, effects, we need to have diverse populations who study them. Um, and one of the things that are so great about the American Heart Association is that it's one of the few funders that actually supports careers of scientists from pre-doctoral to post-doctoral level as assistant professor and mid-career investigators. But there is a greater need to focus on careers of women, because if we look at the numbers of PhD graduates, we have more PhD graduates who are women than men. But somewhere along the line, something happens because when we look at the ranks of newly started professors, we only have about 30, 40 percent of women. And as we go uh, through the career ranks, when you get to my level as a full tenure professor, there may be 20 percent of women who are at that position. And if you look at cross scientists who study heart disease, there are very few women. So it's very important to not only encourage women to study basic sciences, which I think we do a good job because we have so many PhD graduates, but to create an environment that supports them in their endeavors and encourages them to stay, to remove some of these barriers and hostile environments. And one of the ways to do that is to provide funding specifically directed to women investigators who study these important topics. And that's something that I'm very, very passionate about and all of you are as well. So we need to support the women who study other women's diseases. Um, this is a great opportunity to take, before I um, dive into the participants of research, I wanted to just give a public service announcement for Research Goes Red, which is the American Heart Association's initiative. Um, uh, as cardiovascular disease continues to be women's number one health threat, uh, which claims the lives of one in three women, the one research tool that we can um, use to empower women as science and um, find new ways to treat and beat and prevent heart disease. So um, I believe we'll be putting the link to the uh, Research Goes Red uh, website into the chat, but we want people to, to encourage people to use that as a way to um, unite the American Heart Association and our health experts with patients and um, the tools and technologies that will make the difference. Um, but my next question is why do um, women and people of diverse backgrounds need to be participants in this research? Um, I think that we need um, diverse representation in research studies because not we're not all the same. And we really need to in order to say a, 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 a therapy or an intervention that is that works, we need to make sure that it works in a diverse group of not only diverse group of people, but people of different age groups. Um, it used to be that 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 most research studies and women are still underrepresented in studies that deal with coronary artery disease. Um, they seem to be well represented in, in uh, better represented in heart failure trials. But um, when you look at things for high blood pressure or, or coronary trials that they're underrepresented. And so we wanna make sure that we actually improve the way we recruit people for research we have to understand that everybody has, is not at the same health education level um, and health literacy level. So we have to make sure that the message that we're delivering on how to um, engage in a research study is easy for everyone to understand and that people have an opportunity to ask questions about participation in research. Dr. Holtz. I think one of the lessons we learned from COVID is how important it is to study all populations, right? Because for example, in developing the vaccine, we want it to work in absolutely everyone across age groups, across genetic differences, across ethnic groups. And the same idea is applicable to all diseases, right? When we study the diseases and the interventions for these diseases, we have to make sure that we really cover across various populations and age groups. That was a very, very excellent point because sometimes we, we only study in healthy 
males. And that is really not, not the answer to many of the questions we're seeking. And I think there was a question in the chat, what is the sweet spot for research? Um, the sweet spot is really to study absolutely everything. Any idea is important because we don't know when it's going to become crucial. For example, the mRNA vaccines, again, going to the idea of COVID, that was something that was sort of an understudied idea that turned out to be absolutely the best idea we had for development of vaccines. So we really don't know when something will become very useful. So it's absolutely crucial to study across different areas and um, bring different kinds of investigators to the table with diverse ideas because all of these ideas will have a value. Yeah, I also want to um, jump in about the question that asked about the sweet spot, spot in research. And so for the model has always been for research to be done in academic medical centers. And I think for the doc kind of work that Dr. Holst does that that's important to do. But if you look at an example of a company that's funded research um, and one of them is J&J, &J, J&J has funded a research study that looked at using an Apple Watch to determine whether somebody is in atrial fibrillation. And currently they're recruiting for a study called Heartline, which is going to look at people, groups of people over the age of 65 who don't yet have diagnosis of atrial fibrillation and do have AFib and to look at the utility of using an Apple Watch. So this is something that's being done totally outside of an academic institution with direct recruitment to the patient. So I think we need to look at this point, especially when it comes to heart issues and the difficulty in rec research recruitment, we have to reach out to patients where they are or potential participants, and that might be out of their homes, in the workplace, or at the doctor's office. And one of the great ways to do that is by registering yourself as a patient with Research Goes Red. So that might be a, an avenue to participating in one of these research studies. So thank you for bringing that full circle. <laughs> Um, I did want to talk about STEM careers and um, how we can help women advance their careers in um, STEM and research. And as you mentioned, Dr. Holtz, supporting them once they're in those careers. Yeah, uh, one other barrier to uh, different entrance to careers is having role models. Um, so uh, participation is important in all levels. Um, we need to have mentors for uh, younger scientists who want to participate in the careers because we want them to look up to someone who looks just like them and to say, yes, I can be that person. And that is a career that I'm aspiring to. Um, and I'm sure we also see that in clinical medicine um, where the role models and the mentors are so crucial in advancing careers of women and also careers of various other diverse populations. Um, so not only the, the funding, but also the mentorship and supporting these mentoring relationships is so important in order to encourage women to participate in STEM careers. And I just wanna point out the American Heart Association has a women in cardiology committee and one and and uh, so does the American College of Cardiology, and one of the big efforts of both committees is mentorship, and um, in, in role, participation in the committees are cardiologists, cardiology researchers, and we we do when we had our academic meetings in person had lots of um, meetings for the committees. But I, I know that the American Heart Association worked very hard this past November to actually do some of those meetings by Zoom during the time of the meeting. And I think I I, I agree with you, Marina, that mentorship and and the fact that we we all who are established really have to pave the way forward for those who are coming up. Um, thank you both. You've both been great role models um, for this group and for in your fields. Um, I just want to, we're just a few minutes left in our time together today. So I wanted to give you each a chance to 
um, share some final thoughts with the group. Well, I think it's really important um, to understand the, import, the role that the American Heart Association has in funding research. Other than the NIH, American Heart Association is the largest funder of cardiovascular research. And with that said, since it is the leading killer of both men and women, um, it's important for all of us to support the efforts and to, you know, commit to increasing the participation of women who are performing the research and working to increase the participation of women who, can, who might want to participate in research trials. Yes, and, and the, the other uh, side of this is increasing awareness um, of heart disease in women and also reaching the diverse populations who suffer from some of these health disparities uh, because of lack of awareness or because of lack of access to uh, health care. Uh, so it, 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 the problem has many facets and we need to tackle all of them. And we've shared the link for research goes red in the chat. Just I just shared it again. So we encourage everyone on this call to participate in um, signing up for uh, that database and being a part of research opportunities and advancing cardiovascular science for women. Um, thank you both again for your time today. Uh, I want to thank all of our um, participants for joining us today. We, uh, this is a new series for us. This is, I believe, our third Lattes and Leadership conversation and not our last. We will be continuing them. Um, so far, they've turned out to be about monthly and we hope to continue that um, pace. So uh, feel free to share thoughts and ideas you have for continuing our conversations and areas of topics you'd like to hear about as well. Thank you both Dr. Goldberg and Dr. Holtz for joining us today. Thank you. Thank Great. you so much. And next time we hope with real lattes. Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I have family issues. I don't know if it really particularly matters. Right.